Hi everyone, welcome to AMC Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Clark Wolf, and this is our daily show, bringing you the latest in movie news with insight as to what it all means. Joining me, as always, is AMC Movie News Editor-in-Chief John Campia. John, good morning. Good morning, Clark. Greetings and salutations, everybody. Five. That's the number of times I've seen Man of Steel so far on my way to ten. <laughs> nice work. And also joining us this morning is Managing Editor of ShockTillYouDrop.com, Ryan Trick. Ryan, hey, good morning. how are you? Good Doing morning. well. I'm going to count two for Man of Steel. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hey, still the one. Well, since uh, Ryan is here, this is a good time for us to remind you guys that upcoming at Comic-Con in San Diego, starting on July 17th, is, of course, we're holding our annual Masters of the Web panel, and this year, a very special uh, edition of it. We are having a pure horror theme, and uh, Ryan Turek, of course, is going to be one of our great panelists on there. We're so excited about it. It's on Thursday morning, July 18th at 1130 a.m. in room 24 ABC. Come on down. I'm going to be there. Obviously, Ryan's going to be there. The whole ABC Movie Talk crew is going to be there. Come and join us. And once again, Later in the evening on Thursday night at 7 p.m. in the Omni Hotel, we're going to have our AMC Movie Talk meet and greet. Come on down, meet all of us. Schnepp's going to be there, too. Gray Drake's going to be there. Jimmy O's going to be there. And, of course, the whole crew, all of us, we're going to be there, too. Come on down so we can meet you. We're looking forward to seeing you there. Bring me coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I need that. Since we started AMC Movie Talk, one of the most frequently asked questions that we continue to get in our mailbag is in regards to Christian Bale and will he return as Batman? John has actually answered that question several times in the show, yes. including his recent calm, dignified, and level-headed response. My brothers and sisters of movie fandom, listen to me. Batman's done! Christopher Nolan's Batman is done! It's finished! Christian Bale's not coming back. There is Robin, whatever. Joseph Gordon-Levitt is not going to be Batman. It's not going to be a continuation of the story. It's finished. It's done. We've said it a thousand times. Christopher Nolan has said it a thousand times. What more do you need? Do you need Christopher Nolan to sneak into your house in the middle of the night, creep into your bedroom, lovingly pull down the sheets, give you a nice little tray of candles and scented aromas, and say, look, listen, it's okay, but the movie's done. Is that what you need to finally believe it? It's over. Amy Rose, your thoughts? Batman himself, Christian Bale, was recently interviewed by Entertainment Weekly and was directly asked about the possibility of him returning as the Dark Knight for a future Justice League or other films to which the actor responded with this. We were incredibly fortunate to get to make three Batman films. That's enough. Let's not get greedy. I have no information, no knowledge about anything. I've literally not had a conversation with a living soul. I understand that they may be making a Justice League movie. That's it. It's a torch that should be handed from one actor to another. So I enjoy looking forward to what somebody else will come up with. John, does this put the final nail in the coffin of Bale be being back as Batman speculation? You know, this should be a day of celebration. <laughs> celebrating <laughs> common sense. Celebrating clarity of thought. That this would be the day that all of us as one world uh, come together and acknowledge the Christopher Nolan Batman universe is done. I mean, we've all, most of us have known that already, but some people still hold on. Sadly, no, it's not going to be that day. There are still going to be some people that hold on to the notion that, uh, yes, he will, he'll be back. You know, we made the arguments, but Christopher Nolan just said his universe is done. Doesn't matter, he's coming back, but Christian Bale just told us on the red carpet he'll never play Batman again and never play another superhero again. Doesn't matter, he'll be back. So there will still be people that hold on to this. The, the big thing here, of course, though, is people say to me, well, John, he could change his mind. Well, obviously, that is always the one unpredictable wild card in all this. Of course, uh, the director, the actor, everybody who's involved with this could turn out to be liars, and they could wake up one day with a huge epiphany of galactic proportions and say, no, I have changed my mind. Of course that can happen. But all that we as rational human beings can do is go by what they have told us at this point. And from what they've told us, we've known forever that the Nolan universe is done, Bale as Batman is done, it is time to let it go and to move forward. Of course they can change their mind sometime in the future if they want, but let's just be rational here. That's not the information they're presenting us, so it's done. Ryan, mm. am, am I being too harsh in my interpretation of this? Is there something I'm missing? Could he be back? Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, like, listen here. I mean, like, it really, it, it really hinges. You're being completely rational. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, it, it, and because we it, we've seen people change uh, change tunes before so many times in this industry, but um, it's contingent on a lot of things right now. Legendary might leave Warner Brothers. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a big thing. I talked to um, Thomas Toll, head of Legendary, uh, over the weekend, 
And we asked him about Batman, we asked him about Man of Steel, and he said, listen, those are Warner Brothers DC properties. So it's, it's a possibility that should Legendary stick around and make more Batman movies with Warner Brothers, you know, that whole Christian Bale thing could always be on the table. Christian Bale could change his mind. He might want to take a payday. He might want to go play Batman again. He might play an older Batman. We never know uh, what they're going to do. He could be a passing of the torch kind of thing, where he is the older Dark, dark Knight passing the torch to somebody else. There's all these variables, but for right now, if Christian Bale says no, then it's going to be no. Yeah. Um, uh, for Batman to come back, they're going to have to rejigger some things. and. Um, you know, introduce a new bats for you know this Man of Steel universe since Man of Steel is going to pave the way for Justice League. There's just a lot of variables, but for right now, I thought it was pretty cool of Christian Bale to come forward and just say, "No, that's it, I'm done." Um, but like I said, we've seen actors change tunes before. Yeah, agreed. Michael Keaton never came back to that series, <laughs> which really bothered me. Um, I'd rather, the, the sad thing is I really don't want to see. Um, this kind of new Batman franchise to evolve the way the uh, Burton to Schumacher franchise oh, evolved. Well, yes, you know, where yeah. like we saw one, one new movie with Val Kilmer, and then the next movie, Kilmer was like, enough's enough, man. And then George Clooney came in and gave us like one of the best, worst Batman movies ever. <laughs> um, but uh, listen, I think you said it succinctly and clearly. Um, you know, fans are going to hold on to the hope and let them, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On September 20th, the 1939 classic The Wizard of Oz will have a limited one-week release in theaters to help commemorate the 75th anniversary of one of the most beloved films in cinematic history. Warner Brothers has just released a special trailer for the upcoming re-release. You can see a link to that trailer in the show notes. Ryan, does this trailer get you excited about seeing The Wizard of Oz on the big screen again? As a horror guy, yes, totally. <laughs> 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 oh, yes. Um, no, it, The Wizard of Oz, you know, I mean, we've seen, I grew up uh, seeing The Wizard of Oz on television. I never saw it in the theaters, obviously. Um, but I, you know, I, over the years, I've seen countless re releases and stuff like that. I mean, let's call it what it is Oz the Great and Powerful did excellent at the box office. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually didn't think it was all that bad because of all the little Evil Dead flourishes Sam mm -hmm. Raimi put through <laughs> into it. Um, but you know what? Listen, it, in this wave of remakes and reboots and sequels and so on and so on, it's nice to see an original film get uh, repurposed for re-release. And obviously, they're not going to just dump it in the theaters and go, hey, here's Wizard of Oz. They're going to have to spiffy it up a little bit. And by sp they're going to spiffy it up and put it in IMAX and 3D. Um, to answer your question, though, the trailer was good. It was classy. You know, it's not like... Um, you know, the super slick, slam bam in your face kind of style of trailer that we've mm. seen today. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's cute. I think it's very cute. Mm. <laughs> and I, you know, and I encourage families to go check it out. I mean, like, listen, there's a whole generation that went to go see Oz the Great and Powerful not knowing what the Wizard of Oz was. I would like to think that the parents showed them Wizard of Oz afterwards. Um, but if they haven't, go show it to in, the, in the theater the way it was meant to be seen. Yeah, um, oddly enough, this trailer doesn't get me excited for it. Mm. I, I, Wizard of Oz, I think, is one of the most overrated, but I'm kidding. This is your <laughs> I was going to say, oh <laughs> gosh, no. <laughs> you, th you think I got some hate mail now. Um, no, <laughs> Wizard of Oz is one of the... Look, if there are parents out there who have not shown their children Wizard of Oz and child services needs to be contacted immediately, um, I, I this is one of those movies that, I mean, I think a lot of us, regardless of various movie tastes, I think you're going to find that most of us on this planet... Um, it's just one of those special movies that kind of encapsulates and epitomizes what movie magic is. I mean, I still watch that today. Obviously, effects don't hold up and stuff like that, but I can watch that movie today and still feel this incredible awe and wonder that I, I had as a seven-year-old kid the first time my mom showed it to me. You know, I, I think of certain movies that have done that to me in my life. Wizard of Oz, obviously the original Star Wars. Uh, the Princess Bride did that for me. Hmm. There's a lot of films, There's a, not a lot, there are very few films out there that really capture the magic of what it is to go and watch a movie. And, you know, obviously all of us are different genre takes, whether it be a certain sci-fi film, a certain horror film, whatever, but I think all of us can look at The Wizard of Oz and say, yeah, there's something just historically and, and transcendently special about that film. I cannot wait. The reason the trailer doesn't excite me is because I was already excited. I mean, I, I'm gonna go, there's nothing you can do, like Ryan was saying, to cut this, some, some bombastic yeah, trailer yeah. for it that's gonna make me want, oh, now I gotta see it. They'll show that epic battle scene of the monkeys. No, it's just, it is what it is, and I, I'm already dying to see it, so I, I just cannot wait. I'm gonna camp in the theater for a week and probably watch it three or four times. I'm so excited. Hopefully I can see it with my mom. 
All right, folks, listen, we've reached out part of the show for buy and sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Clark's got a couple of other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And then Ryan and I are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Clark, what do we got? Universal Pictures has released two international posters for director Ron Howard's upcoming film, Rush, opening in AMC theaters everywhere on September 20th. The film stars Chris Hemsworth, Daniel Brühl, and Olivia Wilde as, and is described as follows. Set against the sexy and glamorous golden age of Formula One racing, Rush portrays the exhilarating true story of two of the greatest rivals the world has ever witnessed, handsome English playboy Hunt and his methodical, brilliant opponent, Lauda. Taking us into their personal lives and off the track, Rush follows the two drivers as they push themselves to the breaking point of physical and psychological endurance, where they're there is no shortcut to victory and no margin for error. If you make one mistake, you die. John, buy or sell these new posters I, for Rush. I gotta sell the posters. There's really nothing intriguing. It's just it's the, it's the traditional floating head poster, except the bodies happen to be attached. It's mm -hmm. just they're just standing there. And nothing wrong with that either. Posters sometimes are just there to make us aware that the movie's coming. Nothing wrong with that. But there's nothing to get me excited. Look, Ron Howard though is directing this. Ron Howard directed uh, a draft, uh, Backdraft, which means he will forever get a pass in my book and I'll look forward to whatever he's making. But this is one of those rare occasions where I agree with, with, the, with the outcry of, the trailer showed us everything. Usually trailers don't show us everything, but we all complain that they do. But this is one of those trailers that I kind of feel did show us the entire movie, so I'm not sure what I'm looking forward to next. But overall, for the posters, for me, it's a sell. Ryan? Uh, sell for me. Um, I'm not a big fan of the poster that we're getting a lot of today. You know, like you said, floating right. heads and, uh, you know, just, just kind of like photoshopped and strategically placed. You know, it's just, it's nonsense. Um, as for the movie itself, I'm not that big of a Ron Howard fan, and mm. you guys could boo all you want. Um, <laughs> Backdraft is pretty good, but there's always something about his movies that uh, seem pretty pedestrian to me, um, and they're not connecting with me. I mean, like, I don't know. I don't know. I've always, I've, I've argued through film school um, <laughs> until I was blue in the face about this. So, uh, sell for me on this one. You didn't love the dilemma? You don't see that as cinematic art? What about Willow? <laughs> oh my God, I hate Willow no! so much. I hate Willow so much. <sighs> Oh, my heart. That's, that's you know what? That's an argument for another show. Yeah. And you know what? You can rope in Hook into that one, too. <laughs> no, Different director, but Hook and Willow. Mm. I know. That's for fight. later. <laughs> the, fir the first trailer for the upcoming Kevin Hart Ice Cube comedy Ride Along has hit the web when a fast-talking guy joins his girlfriend's brother, a hot-tempered cop, to patrol the streets of Atlanta. I haven't finished yet. Stop laughing. Oh, he gets entangled in the officer's latest case. Now, in order to prove that he deserves his future bride, he must survive the most insane 24 hours of his life. Ryan, buy or sell the trailer for Ride Along, <laughs> not directed by Ron Howard. You know what? I'm going to sell just based on that. That log line alone. <laughs> um, you know, that log line comes along and you guys had sent it along to me and I was like, hmm, I've never heard of this movie before. Then I watched a trailer and I was like, wow, that doesn't come across at all. This <laughs> just looks like a generic buddy cop movie. But I do like Kevin Hart and I like his size and I like the <laughs> fact that they don't play up the fact, like they play up the fact that Ice Cube is so much bigger than he is. Like, cause sometimes you'll get like the Tom Cruise factor where an actor is really small and put him on an Apple box and make him look like he's the same size as his co-stars. Kevin Hart, no way, man. He's just a small little guy. And um, I, I, there was like maybe one or two things that I laughed at. Otherwise, uh, so it's just, and also that release date, which is January, right? January, yeah, it's yeah. usually the dumping grounds yeah. for some pretty bad movies. You know, I, when you, to call this movie generic is <laughs> ridiculous overpraise, yeah. I think. I got to sell this. And look, uh, I'm actually, I have slowly over time become actually a pretty big Kevin Hart fan. Mm -hmm. I never used to think too much about him, and then mm -hmm. I started watching some of his comedy. And look, call me shocked. I think Like a Man was actually one of those little films that I expected nothing from, and I actually ended up enjoying it quite a bit. I believe Tim's story also directed that. But come on, this is the same guy who directed the first two Fantastic Four films. It's hard to get excited. And I'm sorry, Ice Cube, I just this feels to me just like a rehash. Remember that comedy he did a few years ago for, for TBS with Terry Crews? I think it's called Are, Are We, we there, there Yet? That was it. Isn't it? Where he's like the intimidating brother. I'm sorry. Ice Cube is supposed to be intimidating Terry Crews. I'm supposed to buy this. And it feels like it's just a rehash of that. You're right. I watched this trailer hoping to see something really magical from yeah. Kevin Hart, but nothing. And it's yeah. just the same old Ice Cube shtick. So while I really love Tim Story's last outing with uh, Think Like a Man, and I really like Kevin Hart, I cannot get excited for this film at all. So overall, I got to sell.
The last time Ice Cube was actually good was in 21 Jump Street. I was just thinking <laughs> that. He was, I was so just good because he was Because he was embracing what he's typecast for yes. now, but they were transcending that. Yeah. And I loved it. Completely it so agree. Good. All right, folks, listen, we've reached that part of the show called Mailbag. If you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can email it into us anytime at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Now, you guys send in about 1,000 questions a week, and we can only get to normally two or three on a show. So we've also started a new show on the weekends. As you know, on Saturdays and Sundays, we have AMC Mailbag, where all we do is address your mailbag questions. But for now, Clark's got a few messages pulled out of the mailbag. What do we got? Dijon B writes, Hello AMC Movie Talkers, keep up the awesomeness. John is always reiterating how he hates prequels and that prequels tend to be bad, but that's not necessarily the case. The Hobbit was a prequel and was great. X-Men First Class was a prequel and was great. Monsters University is a prequel and is a fair and solid film. <laughs> Good distinction. Uh, <laughs> while there have been bad prequels, there have also been good and efficient ones. Granted, sequels can be horrible as well. So, do you guys think that the nature and essence of prequels is initially good, but they are just executed poorly, or do you think that the essential idea of a prequel is bad and that filmmakers should stay away from them? I gotta clarify a couple things here. For, number one, I am always talking about how I, I, I don't really generally like the idea of prequels. I've never said I hated prequels, and I've certainly never said they're always bad. But you're right, I have said, generally, I don't like the idea, I'd rather them do something else. Let's talk about The Hobbit for a second. The Hobbit is not a prequel. The Hobbit was written first, okay? <laughs> so The Hobbit was written first, they made the movie later, but The Hobbit was written before Lord of the Rings. Let's talk about X-Men First Class. Um, is it a very good movie? Yes, X-Men First Class, in my opinion, was a very good movie. But at what cost? Um, they had to basically tread all over whatever continuity they had in that universe. Like, for instance, in X-Men 3, you know, uh, uh, Professor Xavier and Magneto were su still supposed to be friends in their late 40s, early 50s, visiting a young Jean Grey. They've built their school together, blah, blah, blah. Well, X-Men First Class being a prequel, in order to have some freedom to make a good story, they had to crap all over their, that continuity. Now they separated as friends much, much earlier, and, and other things as well. The problem with prequels that I have generally is that Number one, you're in a situation where you know certain things are going to happen and you know certain things aren't. And I don't like knowing that going in. Like even with Monsters University, which I liked a great deal, okay, I know, you know, Mike and Sully are not going to stop being friends. I know this guy. <laughs> Somehow at the end, by the end, they're working at Monsters Inc. and blah, 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 blah. And with prequels, you know that. So in doing a prequel, you either have to be pretty predictable with some elements that you're going to do. You have to crap over existing continuity. Uh, and then there's these other elements, and that's why I say I generally don't like the idea of prequels. I would prefer them doing something else. But like X-Men First Class, and like Monsters University, yes, you can make something good. Absolutely you can. It's just I think they could have made something better with a sequel to Monsters, Inc. I think they would have made something better out of X-Men, but we have what we have. Ryan, you and I have never talked about this topic yeah. before. What, what's your stance on prequels? Do you get excited about the sound of a prequel or turned off by it? Or I, I keep my mind open to prequels just because if you're going to bring something, you're going to introduce a new layer to the story mm. of something that we already, that exists, that we love, then I'm open to it. Um, you're right, there is a certain level of uh, expectation and you're already kind of predicting where it's going to wind up going because you know the outcome of certain things. Right. But if you handle something like, if you take a look at something like uh, Prometheus, okay? Right. Not a good movie. Let's just put that on the table. It's <laughs> not a good film. However, the idea of, of telling something that's within the same universe that's set before the events of Alien, that's a cool idea. That's yeah. the kind of prequel I like. Something that's going to expand the universe, uh, introduce new story elements, and give you a little bit more insight as to what the outcome will be later on. That's cool. Um, we're seeing a lot of prequels on television right now, um, like with Hannibal and Bates yeah. Mattel, and I think yeah. both of those are excellent. Uh, Hannibal more so than Bates, but um, but those are also repurposing and, like you said, kind of treading over the continuity that comes later on. Right. Um, I, like I said, I'm, I'm completely open to prequels. It just really depends on the uh, the angle that's going to be chosen. And you and like X Men First Class, you can't um, you can't trample over, <laughs> over the continuity because I have no <laughs> idea where they're going to go with the next one. Yeah. And I think the next one is just going to is going to be Brian Singer trying to like right some wrongs and try to figure out how to uh, you know make those continuities work with time travel of all things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, um, but yeah, I'm open to prequels. I'm a game. I mean, look at the Batman movies. The Bat I mean, Batman Begins kind of was. That was I mean, like a both reboot, in the reboot though, right? and that was starting uh, over. Yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. No, uh, the one great example of use of prequelness was in act prequelness. I just made up a word. Mm -hmm. uh, the prequelness, which as it wasn't actually even a prequel, but elements of it. Let's say Godfather Two, one of the great American movies ever made. 
Um, at least one third of that movie was prequel, but yeah. the movie it's in itself wasn't prequel, and that was brilliant. So it's well, what's the difference between prequels and flashbacks then? Yeah, that's, that's true. I because guess Godfather Two is to me a sequel of flashbacks. Mm. You, you're so deep. <laughs> I have no answer for oh, that. Oh, let me let me drop a let me drop a prequel <laughs> on you that I do love. Uh, I love Amityville Two: The Possession, oh, okay. which is a prequel to the Amityville Horror, <laughs> oh, <my laughs> which sets up the right. family. Um, the family that gets murdered before the family that moves into the house in Amityville Horror takes place. But it, the continuity on that whole thing is a little wonky. But, still a uh, great example. Still, yeah. Maybe uh, Jaws 5 could be a prequel. <laughs> just a wee shark? Just putting, <laughs> a wee shark just swimming putting it in the out ocean? There. Finding Jaws. <laughs> Finding Jaws, I love it. <laughs> Jason Weber writes, hi guys, thanks for the awesome show. I know you've talked about the new Tomb Raider movie that's in the works, but I was wondering, since they're recasting, who would you pick to play the new Lara Croft? Oof. Keep up the good work. Hmm. You know, I'm, there are two names that come to mind for me. One is a very obvious one, and I'll get to that one in a second. Uh, one is uh, Gemma Arterton, mm. and I hope that that's the pronunciation. She actually played Gretel um, in Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters. And you know what? That was a movie, I'm not going to sit here and defend it, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you it was good. But it was better than I thought it would be. And I had a little bit more fun watching it than I thought I would. That's not saying too much if you know how low my expectations were. But I thought, I looked at her and I thought, she's got some star potential. And I could see her as a lower crop. The other one is, is an obvious one, but she's still my pick. And that's uh, Camilla Luddington. She's a British actress who actually did the motion capture and the voice for, for Laura Croft in the new game. But she just did a season of Californication. Um, and if you saw her in that, she was really good in that. And she's a regular right now on Grey's Anatomy. She's beautiful. She's talented. Um, she may not, some people may say she's not busty enough. Fair enough. Uh, but, you know, Laura Croft's been redesigned a little bit too. So that's really not as big of an issue. So I would personally lean towards Camilla Luddington as my choice. Ryan, what about you? Gosh, I've been thinking about this the entire way over. And all I can say is I could point to a lot of hot cosplayers that will be at Comic-Con <laughs> that I will choose to be the next Laura Croft. <laughs> Ladies, if you're out there, let's try to make that happen. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go with Gemma. Um, you know, I mean, like, honestly, I, I didn't even think about her until now, right. but she is excellent in uh, Hansel and Gretel. She's, uh, she plays a vampire in this new movie coming out, or that's now a VOD called uh, Byzantium. Uh, the new oh, Neil yes. Jordan film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, she's just a she's a solid actress. She's got the look. She's got the vibe. She's got the body. She's got the attitude. I, I vote for her. It's a good pick. Yeah. Good choices. Whoever doesn't get the role can just play Wonder Woman, right? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas Rojas writes, "Hey guys, love the show." I've been looking over the web about the Man of Steel sequel, and one article got my attention. Michael Rosenbaum, who played Lex Luthor on the, on the show Smallville, has said that he's up for to play the role once again. <laughs> Smart move. If he got the role in the Man of Steel sequel. What do you guys think of this? Mm, is he? Is he <laughs> up for that? Or is it just, you know, actor... Actor Buzz. No, I, th I think it's him saying, hey, I'd be up for it. Yeah, I, don't uh, think, I don't think he's up for it. Here's, here's the thing. Um, I always kind of laugh when, when an actor says, hey, I'd totally love to do that, and then fans get excited thinking that means it's actually a possibility. Right. Really? An actor would love to be in one of the big blockbuster franchises going right now? Let me specify that. Really? An unemployed actor <laughs> would really love to be in the big franchise? Let's not forget, Michael Rosenbaum left Smallville because he thought he was going to make it big. He thought he was now big enough that he could go out, get some leading roles in TV shows and movies and all this kind of stuff, and nothing happened. I, yeah, I think he was, was around a the sorority boys. Well, I was going to say, was wasn't it around the time he did Wes Craven's Curse? Uh, yes, it was. It was Curse that he did, right? Mm. And then, and that was about it. Yeah. Um, but look, I had this. I have this conversation with people all the time when it comes about Tom Welling, usually. But folks, Smallville is not Superman. I loved Smallville. I watched every single season, even the couple of bad ones that were in there. I watched every single season. Loved the show. But just as the show creators always said. Smallville was like an alternate, it was an elsewhere version of Superman. It wasn't actually Superman. It was an alternate universe, kind of different look at what could have been. And I always appreciated that. Michael Rosenbaum is not Lex Luthor. I loved him in the show, yes, but Smallville is Smallville. Superman is Superman. Never the twain shall meet. They're two different things. Mm -hmm. He can never be in there, right? I completely think? agree with you. And I love the, the fact that you dropped Elseworld because <laughs> that is something that when we grew up, I mean, that's what yep. we grew up on is those kinds of comic books. like. Batman Gotham by Gaslight, you know, yes. it's like all that kind of stuff. And I think that that same principle can, uh, can be applied to 
uh, the movies, especially with the reboots we've been getting and stuff mm. like that. Uh, no, keep everything separate. I don't want this fan servicing where it's like, oh, I love Smallville so much and I want Tom Willing, I want all everybody to come back. No, <laughs> Zack Snyder's universe, David Goyer's universe, Chris Nolan's universe, just start fresh. I don't even know who I'd want. To, I don't even know if I want to see Lex Luthor <laughs> in this universe yet. Mm. I mean, like, yeah, Lex Corps is was teased in the first film, but you know what? Save Lex Luthor for like number three. Give me something new in two. All right. Yeah. Frankie S. writes, I was wondering with the news I heard from you guys about more Friday the 13th movies on the way, what's going on with the Halloween franchise? Last news I heard was Halloween 3D was being made. So any news on this? Before I throw this over to Ryan, just, just so you know what he's talking about when he says I heard there's going to be more Friday the 13th. So what happened was Christopher Nolan, of course, has got his new film coming called Interstellar. And he was doing that not with Warner Brothers, but was doing that with Paramount Pictures. Paramount and Warner Brothers then made a deal because Warner Brothers wanted to stay in the Christopher Nolan business. In order to come on and be a partner with Interstellar, they released the rights to Friday the 13th. And, and, um, I love that. That's a little leverage. I know, I know. And, <laughs> that and, amongst and, other and, things. Um, and uh, 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 um, come on down to, what's the name of the cartoon show? Dixieville. The cartoon show? With Cartman. Oh, South Park. Oh, South Park. Come on down. I can know the song. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, South Park. They released the rights to South Park and Friday the 13th yeah. back to Paramount. So Paramount... I, I guess was interested in getting the rights to Friday the 13th. Now we haven't heard anything about a new Friday the 13th movie coming officially and things are in motion, but we just know that Paramount wanted the rights back, so clearly they have plans. So Ryan, at that point, mm -hmm. I've reached the end of any knowledge I have on any of this. Yeah. What do well, you know? Up until that point, I mean, you know, the rights were entangled with a couple of entities. It was yeah. Paramount, Warner Brothers, New Line, and Platinum Dunes. Now, Platinum Dunes is still involved. They're the ones who gave us the Friday the 13th reboot that did very well at the box office. Um, but it was like trying to get a sequel off the ground was, again, a whole rights issue. So this mm -hmm. makes things a lot easier now that it's uh, just with Paramount and over at Platinum Dunes. Um, from my understanding, they have until 2015 to execute uh, right. this whole rights thing. So between now and 2015, we'll probably see a Friday the 13th film. I have no idea. But they what, only have to what? be in production by 2015, right? Right. They right. Don't actually yeah. Have to in yeah. Yet. So I have no idea like what approach I, it's they're due for a call from me. Um, <laughs> I know that there was a script uh, for Friday the 13th Part Two uh, it, that exists, um, written by the same guys who did Friday the 13th 2009, uh, Damian Shannon and Mark Swift, uh, that gave us uh, uh, Jason Voorhees in the snow. Uh, for a few scenes. So um, I know that a script for the sequel is, exists. Whether Paramount decides to you know, execute that script or move forward with a whole new approach is to be decided, but we'll hopefully get something soon. All right, folks, so listen, uh, that's it for us. We've run out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, listen, before you do anything else, while I've got you, take a second. Click that subscribe button. Become a subscriber to our AMC Movie News YouTube channel. We'll keep you up to date on everything going on in the world of movie news. And, of course, our daily AMC Movie Talk Show and our weekend AMC Mailbag Show. Make sure you follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash amctheaters. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash amctheaters. And go on out and see a movie tonight. There's still a ton of really good stuff opening and in theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater show time and movie ticket information. I want to thank, as always, our lovely host, Ms. Clark Wolf. Clark, where can people find you online? I am on Twitter at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E, and Facebook at um, Official Clark Wolf. Official Clark very Wolf. Very official. official. Very official. <laughs> I want to thank our very special guest. He is the managing editor over at ShockTodayDrop.com, one of the very best horror sites on the web. And, Thanks. of course, most importantly, I'm sure the crowning feather in his achievement in life so far, he's one of the panelists on the Masters of the Web panel coming up, Mr. Ryan Turk. Ryan, where can thank people you. find you online? Uh, I'm on the unofficial Ryan Turk. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, underscore Ryan Turek, um, because someone took Ryan Turek, or at STYD News, or on Facebook at Ryan Rotten, which is a former alias of mine. <laughs> and people can visit your site every day. Or yes, at shocktillyedrop.com. Daily hey. horror news around the clock, because I'm glued to my computer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have no creativity in my name. I'm John Campion, whether it's on Facebook or on Twitter, so find me there. So thanks a lot for joining us, guys. Uh, make sure you join us again tomorrow. My name's John Campion for AMC Movie News, and until then, bye-bye.